All right. Rejecting God. So what we've been talking about for about the last month to six weeks is David chasing purpose. David being anointed by God to be God's chosen people. But David has had a lot of ups and downs in his life since God anointed him king of God's chosen people. And we talked about last time that David lost everything because he decided to live like he wanted to do. He wanted to hang out with the worldly people. He wanted to hang out in a place called Gath with unbelievers, living his best life. And David know better. He know better, but sometimes in life we get distracted. But God has a way of getting your attention. So what had happened, David said, you know what? I'm tired of waiting on God. I'm just going to do this myself. This life, this journey of faith is a little bit too difficult. So what I'll do, I'll just go back to the world and live my best life. Not on God's watch. God has gotten David attention. And what he has allowed to happen is the enemy has come in and took David's two wives and his children. David don't know where they're at. He returned home. His house, his city, his town is crushed and burned to the ground. Now, up until this point, David wasn't writing no psalms. He wasn't seeking the Lord until God got his attention. And now his wives and his kids and the rest of the men are gone. But David recovered it all. He recovered it all. And David has recovered everything from the Amalekites. That's what that was the enemy. The Amalekites had came in and destroyed and took everything from David. But the word says nothing was missing when he finally got his wives back, when he finally got his family back. But more than anything, God now has his attention. That's what we talked about last time. Recover it all. You're going to recover it all. What the enemy stole from you, God will give it back to you. But you got to change your behavior like David did. You got to start seeking the Lord on a more intimate level. You got to be more intentional in this season with your seek of the Lord. If you want to recover what, God, what the enemy has stolen from you. But tonight we're going to talk about rejecting God. Although David has just come out of a war with the Amalekites. He straight slaughtered them bad boys. It's another war that's going on. It's between God's chosen people and another enemy called the Philistines. So David fought the Amalekites. That's one enemy. But it's another enemy out there called the Philistines. That's where Goliath, them Goliath folks, his cousins, grandmama knew. That's, that's, that's who over there with the Philistines. But this is the thing. When David was walking in disobedience in chapter 30 for a year and four months, when he called himself living his best life, that's who he was hanging out with. He was hanging out with the amount. He was hanging out with the Philistines in Gath. Them his homeboys. You know, the ones he used to hang out with. The ones he used to go out and smoke hookah with. Pop bottles. Run the women, pop, jumping planes. Those are the people when he used to hang out in the world. But those are same, those are the same people that are fighting against God's chosen people. And David was so far off and had stranded so far from the Lord. He was about to help the Philistines defeat God's chosen people. That's how far he had drifted off. It don't take long for you to drift off back into your past life, back into disobedience, back into a reckless lifestyle if we don't stay at the feet of Jesus. I often say this, you one text message, email, phone call away from going back to where you used to be or even worse. That's why we have to stay humble. While we out here talking about somebody else, bro, you could be in that same situation. If somebody just called and said your son was in a bad car accident, they don't know if he going to make it. Mama got a counsel report. You got a counsel report. 
And sometimes God don't answer or make you feel good like that alcohol or that sex. So let's be careful about walking in condemnation and trying to talk about people like we always been saved. Because David was in a bad place. My boy went out with the unbelievers. Totally distracted. For a year and four months, we don't have any recollection of him writing psalms to the Lord, him praying, him fasting, him going to church, no word or anything. David was willing to fight against God. Because he was going to fight with the Philistines until the Philistines rejected him. Thank God for the rejections in our life. Thank God that the Lord broke that relationship up. Thank God that you didn't get that promotion that you put in for. Thank God because you was headed down a path of destruction. Just like David. Thank God for the rejections. Do we realize, I got a question. Do we realize that when we consistently choose things over God like David did, he chose Gath. He chose his own opinion. He chose his emotions. He chose all these other things over God. Do we realize that when we do stuff like that, it's you rejecting God? I know we don't like saying it like that, but a lot of times our lifestyles are consistently rejecting God. We just call it idolatry. But that don't make us uncomfortable. I want us to really say, man, I'm rejecting God. Same thing, it just sting a little different when you own the fact like, dang, bro, I rejecting God, man. And we all know how bad rejection feels. We know how bad it is for you to find out that your significant other cheating on you or for you to buy your child everything that they want and then they leave your house and forget about you like you hadn't done anything. Or for a lot of us, our family rejects us because we choose to not do or engage in the conversations or the lifestyles that we grew up around. The rejection don't feel good. And sometimes we have been connected to ministries and churches that don't necessarily like us, don't like with our hats or our T-shirts or our fitted or our ones. They don't like us. So they have rejected us. We know how rejection feels. Yet. We do it all the time to God. All the time, my boy. I ain't talking about just one time. I'm talking about your whole lifestyle. Rejecting God. David rejected God for a year and four months when he chose to go to Gath. For a year and four months. I understand that. But what we're going to talk about tonight is King Saul the king of God's chosen people. And if you have been here with me for a while, you know how reckless, how calloused, how hard-headed, how disobedient, how wicked King Saul was or is. But we also see another people that reject God. And that's God's chosen people, the Israelites. So we see David has rejected God for a year and four months. King Saul has consistently rejected God. But I don't want to read this text too fast because God's chosen people have 1000% rejected him. So how we're going to start out tonight. Since it's been so, since since. Since it's been a long time since I talked about it, since we talked about it, let's go back to chapter eight and see how we go end up in chapter 31. Because I think some of us forget. But when I went through this today, man, it made my heart heavy to realize that I see me. I see us. I see the United States. I see people close to me. I see my family. I see a lot of people operating like these individuals. In chapter eight, we go go through chapter eight. Let's review. Let's see how we end up, how these people end up and how we end up in some bad, toxic situations. And then we sit back and try to blame God. Why all this bad stuff happening? I'm finna prove it to you tonight. Hold tight.
Y'all ready? Chapter 8, New Living Translation. Rejecting God. I often hear people say, if God is so good, why is all this bad stuff happening? I hear people often say, when I read the Old Testament, it seems like God lets everything take place. He let all the unaliving and slavery and all this stuff take place. But we don't read the Bible, so we don't really know the full story. But right here tonight in chapter 8, I'm going to show you why the Old Testament looked the way it looked. This is God's chosen people now. These folks that we fight tooth and nail about bragging about, we're God chosen people. But I'm going to show you how hard headed these folks are. And it says in chapter eight, I'm going to read the first nine verses. As Samuel grew old. As Samuel grew old. He appointed his sons to be judges over God's chosen people. Remember, when God took the people out of bondage in Egypt, they didn't have a king. They just had appointed people at particular times called judges. They didn't have a king. They just had leaders. Samson was a leader. Samuel was a leader. Gideon was a leader. Uh, Deborah was a leader. That's in the book of Judges. God would appoint an individual to help his people or get them out of bondage. That's who Samuel was. But Samuel was also a high priest and a prophet. But Samuel was growing old, so he appointed his sons to be judges over God's chosen people. Joel and Abijah, his oldest son, held court in Beersheba. But they were not like their father, for they were greedy for money. They accepted bribes and perverted justice. Finally, all the elders of God's chosen people met at Ramah to discuss the matter with Samuel. So the people come in to Samuel because right now Samuel, their leader, they say, look, you are now old and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. Samuel was displeased with their request and he went to the Lord for guidance. God said, do everything they say to you, for they are rejecting me, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. Ever since I brought them from Egypt, they have continually abandoned me and followed other gods. They have continually, not just one time, continually. Abandoned me and followed other gods. And now they are giving you the same treatment. Do as they ask. But solemnly warn them about the way a king will reign over them. This has become a lifestyle. For God's chosen people. God said y'all have continually. I'm talking about continually. If you read the Old Testament, you'll see God's chosen people reject God over and over. And he'll raise up a person to get them out of bondage because the consequences of them rejecting God, he will allow a stronger nation to come in and take over them and make them slaves. So God said, OK, since you want a king like everybody else, I'm going to give it to you. Since you want that man so bad, you hit him up and good morning text him every day and you know you don't supposed to be dating. But because you want that man so bad, I'm going to give it to you because you want that woman so bad because she thick, she pretty. I'm going to give it to you because that's all you pray about anyway. That's all you pray about. That's all you post about. That's all you talk about. Since you want it so bad, I'm going to give it to you. That's what he told his people. I ain't talking to y'all. I'm talking to God's chosen people. He said, go ahead, do as they say, my boy. Because this is the thing that we have to understand about God. God not about to force himself on you. That's why I don't be back and forth in the comment section. Bro, I'm not finna try to force this gospel on you. 
Jesus sent his disciples out. He said, if a house receive you, cool. If they don't, shake the dust off your feet and keep it moving. I shake my dust off the feet. I ain't finna be jumping in your inbox trying to quote no scriptures. I ain't about to be praying. on you. Hey, do you need me to pray for you? I don't care nothing about none of that. I'm not about to force this word on you. I'm going to present it to you and it's up to you to receive it. God presents himself to you and it's up to you whether or not you receive him. So if you keep praying about something, God said, okay, I'll give it to you. Just like his people wanted a king like the other nations. They are actually rejecting God because they want a king like the other nations. What's your king? <laughs> what you want more than you want God? Some of y'all want marriage more than you want God. Some of y'all ain't seeking the Lord to be a daughter, to be a son. You seeking the Lord to be a husband or to be a wife. Those are two different things. You want the things of God instead of himself. You don't want God himself. You're not saying, Lord, fill me with your spirit, transform my heart, make me more like you. You're talking about, Lord, make me a wife. Some of you ain't even praying that. Some of you just praying for a husband. That's it. Some of us just want a big house and a nice car. That's it. Some of us just want to be seen. No, I want a big platform. I want to be out spreading the gospel. You just want attention. You don't want God. You just want stuff. God's chosen people want a king. They don't want God. But God, through his love and kindness, says, okay. Okay. Sam, you ain't, don't worry about it, my boy. It's not that they're rejecting you. They're rejecting me. Reggie, you don't have haters because it's you. They're reject. They're, they're hating on me. That's why I don't be getting offended. Because you don't like what I do. It ain't you rejecting me. It's you rejecting God. Keep reading. Verse 10 through 17. God gives them red flags. God gives them a warning. So Samuel passed on the Lord's warning to the people who were asking him for a king. This is how a king will reign over you. Red flags. We love ignoring red flags, don't we? We don't care nothing about red flags. I see us hee hee and then ha ha in the comment section. We got little funny memes. We repost. The red flags turn pink. Yes, it's a circus. Yeah, okay. It's a circus today. Yes, girl, he fine, so I don't really care nothing about none of that. <laughs> Red flags turn white. Okay. Let's keep reading, because I ain't talking to you. I'm talking about God's chosen people. They, they see red flags, and they turn pink. Okay. Since we think it's so funny. Let's keep reading. So Samuel passed on the Lord's warning to the people who were asking him for a king. This is how a king will reign over you, Samuel said. The king will draft your sons and assign them to his chariots and his charioteers, making them run before his chariots. Some will be generals and captains in his army. Some will be forced to plow in his fields and harvest his crops. And Saul will make his weapons and chariot equipment. The king will take your daughters from you, force them to cook, bake and make perfumes for him. He will take away the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his officials. He will take a tenth of your grain and your grape harvest and distribute it among his officers and attendants. He will take your male and female slaves and demand the finest of your cattle and donkeys for his own use. He will demand a tenth of your flocks and you will be his slaves. What's your king? What up, Chase? What's your king? Could be a man. Could be a woman. Could be your job. You prayed and fasted for this job. You ain't prayed and fasted to receive the Holy Spirit, but you prayed and fasted for a job. That's your king. It could be your sexuality. 
You love that more than you love the Holy Spirit. Love God. Okay. That's your king. It could be a bad habit. Could be your circle. Some of y'all can't nobody tell you nothing. All you want to listen to is your circle. That they don't believe. They don't pray. They can't get a prayer through. But you are conditioned to, to consult with them for guidance about your relationship with the Lord as well as your husband and your wife, that type of stuff. Your circle, social media could be your king. Substance abuse. Could be music. Ain't that wrong with R&B music? <laughs> Could be PlayStation. You spend more time on PlayStation than you do in the Bible. It could be your king. I ain't saying you're going to hell. I'm just trying to, to provoke the thought of, dang, bro. I spent six hours at the gym today. Ain't read, not now scripture. Ain't prayed, not now time. But I went and hooped for six hours. Yeah, that was me. That was me. Ooh. Dang, I worked 16 hours today. And then I'm going to let a girl come through later on tonight. night. But I ain't read, not nan scripture. Ain't read, not nan nothing. But I love the Lord. I'm a Christian. Cap. Could be travel. You'll book a trip real quick. I'm talking about for four, five days, my boy. But somebody asks you to log on and listen to the Lord for 25 to 30 minutes and you, I can't, I can't seem to stay awake. Okay. Wait till we get through tonight. I guarantee you stay awake. You may not sleep tonight. You better go ahead and log off now. I just warned you. It could be your ambition. Oh, you like LLCs and degrees. You'll go back to school and get a doctorate. Study for hours. But don't know not nan scripture. <laughs> not nan scripture. Don't know no scripture. Enemy busting your head, but you're a doctor. But you don't know no word. If we exerted that amount of energy into the Lord, we will be casting out demons, speaking with new tongues, laying hands upon the sick, and they shall recover. All of that. What's your king? David's king for a year and four months, we discussed, was King of Kish. Remember, I told you David got distracted. He went back to Gath. So at that point in time, his king was King of Kish. We have been studying about David and King Saul for about 20 chapters, and we see the King Saul king was himself. He loved himself. He took a selfie every day. He I ain't making it up. This dude built a statue of himself. He loved himself way too much. Loved himself more than he loved God. But the people king was King Saul. For 40 years, they have consistently rejected God for 40 years. But this is the terms that the Lord because he loved him, he said, hey, I'm telling you, I'm telling you from the jump. This is what's going to happen if you choose this king over me. This is what's going to happen. You are already sleeping with the man. You already know he got three kids, three baby mamas. He can't keep a job. He stay with his mama, but you still jump in a relationship with him. You still jump in a relationship with him. You talk to him because he was fine and he was six foot and he had a six pack. He told you he was married, but you didn't want to hear him. Some of us don't hear. Do a horrible job of hearing. You know that dude told you was you were married. You kept talking. Like he didn't tell you. You know that woman. Just with you with your, for your money. You don't care. Do you? I know it. She thick. All right, cool. Keep on. God is warning you before you jump into these relationships. But don't get on social media and prop your phone up and play victim like you didn't know. You just ignored the red flags. 
But you go paint the picture like he lied, she lied. No, you knew from the jump. He didn't have to say nothing, bro. He stayed with his mama, got three kids by three baby mamas, and he can't keep a job. How many more red flags do you need? But you just wanna you just wanna have somebody, right? Oh, okay, cool. I ain't talking to you. I'm talking to God's chosen people. I ain't talking to you. These are the terms. Because I don't like when we read fast. This is what the Lord told them. You will be slaves. Verse 17 says you will be his slaves. But look at the terms that are used between verses 10 and 17. I don't like reading fast. I told you that earlier. Draft. A sign, making, forced, make, force, take, 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 take. Yeah, that, they're right there. I underlined them. Those are the terms. Draft, assign, making, force, make, take, force, take, 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 demand. That's in the, you know, this king that you prayed for, that you want more than you want God, that's exactly what's going to happen. He go draft your sons, assign them to his chariots, making them run, force to plow, make his weapons, take your daughters, force them to cook, take away the best of your fields, take a tenth of your grain, take your male and female servants, demand. That's the king, that's the man, that's the woman, that's the thing that you want more than you want the Lord. You will be your slaves. But this is the four things, major things that this king that you pray for is going to impact your life. Finna take you all the way down through though. You got selfies with him. You got your profile pictures. You and him. <laughs> you posted. They, I accepted the promotion. Okay. I'm going back to school to get my doctorate. Okay. I just bought this big old house. I got to take a picture of it and show off. Okay. Did you consult with the Lord? I ain't hating. I ain't hating because you got a big house or because you booed up. I just know sometimes we choose stuff over God, but let's talk about it. How is this going to impact you? These people have been impacted by a king that they are praying for. Look at how it impacts them. Children. Children. Verse 11 says he would draft your sons and assign them to his chariots and his chariots, his charioteers, making them run before his chariots. Some would be generals and captains in his army. Some would be forced to plow in his fields and harvest his crop. Some would make his weapons. The king would take your daughters. The best. No, take your daughters from you and force them to cook and bake and make perfumes from him for him. One way this king. Remember, what's your king is going to impact you is going to impact your kids. Why? Because you work 80 hours a week. You ain't got time to be a good parent, an effective parent because you're overworked. You don't and not only do can you effectively parent can't effectively parent. You ain't got time to worship. You don't have time to, to uh, worship. But there's a king you chose. Well, Reggie, well, Reggie, I don't have any kids. You got a mama and a dad and a sister and a brother and you got nieces and nephews. My obedience uh, impacts my brother. My obedience impacts my father. My obedience impacts my mama. My obedience impacts y'all. I don't have any kids. I don't have to worry about that. I can just live my best life. Family. Your kids are impacted by this king that you chose. Your finances. He will take away the best of your fields and vineyards. Olive groves and give them to his own officials. He will take a tenth of your grain and your grape harvest and distribute it among his officers and attendants. And he will take your male and female slaves and demand the finest of your cattle. 
It's going to impact your finances. The king you chose. Bro, you chose that woman over God. Child support busting your head. Child support busting your head. I know you didn't see it. I ain't talking to you. I'm talking about God chosen people. Yo, you chose that woman over God. You chose those women over God. Child support busting your head. I, I'm just saying, that's what he say right here. <laughs> Bank full of money, but you still broke. You choose a king over God. He is already telling you. It's going to impact your kids. It's going to impact your finances. It's going to impact your time. Your rest. You don't have time to worship. The fact you don't have time to worship, that's why you can't sleep at night. Those who abide in the secret place of the Most High shall find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. You don't have rest because you're not in the shadow. Plus, you don't have time. So, since your head getting bust with child support, you got to work 16 hours. You got to pull up the overtime. You got to get a second job, my boy, because child support is your head. But the fourth thing, I told you this word was going to hit. Help me, Holy Ghost. It's going to impact your family, your kids. This king you choosing over God. No, I'm not going to say choose over God. This king that's causing you to reject God is going to impact your kids and your family. It's going to impact your finances. It's going to impact your time and your rest. But this is the game changer. This is what it's going to impact more than anything. The fourth one. I hope y'all writing these down. So the next time somebody come up in your face with a pretty smile, you pull these out and say, Ooh, if I choose this, my kids go impact it. Ooh, if I choose this, my money finna be messed up. Ooh, if I choose this, my time and my rest going to be messed up. But this is the thing is the trick of the enemy. Verse 18. Help me, Holy Ghost. Verse 18. When that day comes, you will beg for relief from this king you are demanding, but then the Lord will not help you. When that day comes, what day? When my kids are led astray in the streets, in prison? What day when my finances are messed up? I'm barely making it paycheck to paycheck. What day when I can't sleep at night and I don't have time to worship? I'm working 80 hours a week. I don't, I don't, I don't have time to go to church. I don't, I don't have time. That day, that, that day, when that day comes, you will beg for relief from this king you are demanding. But then the Lord will not help you. The fourth thing that is going to impact your relationship with God. The Lord will not help you. After all that. After they beg for relief. This some of us, I ain't, I'm not talking to God's chosen people right here. I'm talking to us. Some of us head hard as a Chinese word puzzle. You can log into this four days a week and you st still don't listen. Somebody hit me up today, other day, yesterday. She was like, Reg, if you could change one quality about the women that you come in contact with, what would you change? I said they mouth because they don't listen. Lord, they don't listen. 
And I ain't saying men don't are good listeners. I'm just telling you that the majority of people in this community are women and they do not. Lord, why y'all don't listen? Just, yep, 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 yep. Ask me a question and I got to over talk you while I'm answering the question that you gave me. Please, 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 please. I ain't trying to be rude. Please be quiet. Lord, open up heaven and send an anointing of be quiet over us. Lord, teach us to be quiet. Lord, you said in your word that we should be slow to speak, quick to listen. I don't think we understand what slow means. Slow means slow, like not fast. That means like slow, slow, slow down, slow. Lord, help us. Help me too, because sometimes my mouth be moving too fast. Lord, take, I tell you what, take our breath away. If we supposed to be quiet and, you, and we choosing to talk, take our breath away, please. Please. I'm begging you, Father. Help us. We Help us, Jesus. But look, I ain't, I'm talking to God's chosen people. Verse 19. But the people refuse to listen. I'm in the Bible. I'm in the Bible. Reggie, you're too harsh. I'm reading the scriptures. The scriptures said, but the people refuse to listen. <laughs> what in the Christian TikTok is going on? The people refuse <laughs> to listen. The people refuse to listen to Samuel's warning. This is what they say. Sound just like us. Tell you. Hey, babe, I think you need to stop traveling so much. Hey, babe, I don't think it's time for you to date. Hey, babe, I think you need to unplug from social media. Hey, babe, I think you be talking too much. You trying to t share your testimony on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Threads, YouTube, Snapchat, you probably need to settle down. Nope, what they say. Even so, we still want a king. We want to be like the nations around us. Our king will judge us and lead us into battle. Don't listen. We don't listen. So Samuel repeated to the Lord what the people had said. So when you come to me for advice and I give you the advice and you do the opposite of what I tell you, I'd be like, hey, Lord, she said she grown. Hey, Lord, she said I'm prophetess, evangelist, minister, pastor. You can't tell me. And that's what she said, God. I ain't trying to be smart. I'm just telling you what she told me. She said. I'm not her mentor. So why is she asking me questions if I'm not her mentor? I ain't trying to be a mentor, but I don't need for you to announce that I'm not your mentor. If I'm not your mentor, stop asking me questions. That's what she, that's, that's what she said. Yeah, she, she, yeah. I'm telling you. So I repeat what y'all tell me back to the Lord. Lord, I told her to stop talking so much. She still, she still. I ain't trying to be, I ain't trying to know control issues. I just know when you are trying to speak and work on our hearts, we have to learn to be quiet. Why? Because you had to teach me the same thing. I used to talk too much. So I'm just trying to help her, right? But she said, it's just my personality. I'm an extrovert. I ain't going to repost this. I can't repost this. I can't. Samuel went back and said, hey, they said they want a king like the other nations, my boy. And uh, the Lord replied, do as they say. And give them a king. So guess what? When I realize you ain't going to listen to nothing I got I to say, I'll be like, go ahead. <laughs> you 
Keep talking. Just go ahead and share your testimony with everybody. Just go ahead and date. Go ahead and travel. Keep doing what you're doing. I ain't Look, you already told me that story. I'm not going to keep replaying the same story over and over. Now we this conversation needs to be solution-based. I can't keep allowing you to keep replaying this same testimony. Okay, what's the solution? So Sam just said, God told Samuel, do as they say, give them a king. Then Samuel agreed and sent the people home. All right. That's what's happened. The people refused to listen. But look at what it did to his sons and daughters. This king that they chose over God. This king that caused them to reject God. Does, I got a question for you. Do this not look like the United States? Look at our kids. The enemy has overtaken our sons and our daughters. Look at us. Jacked up. Because we have chose things, people, the universe over the lower. And now look at us. Look at our finances jacked up. We live in a country that's full of debt. Time jacked up. We don't have time to serve the Lord. We can't even sleep. Look like the United States to me. But it looked like some of our lives as well. Let's see what happens when we choose stuff over God. And that's what brings me to 1 Samuel 31. Lord, help me, Holy Ghost. Lord, help us. Let's see what if what God says come true about the sons and the daughters and the finances and their him not helping them because they have consistently rejected him. Consistently. Y'all ready? 1 Samuel 31. Rejecting God. My heart got heavy when I read this earlier. I ain't, I, ain't, I ain't joking, bro. My heart got heavy, heavy. I'm like, Lord, why I got to give this? I, I just gave a heavy word last week. Why I got to give another one? I got to do what the Lord tell me to do. There's a war going on with God's chosen people and the Philistines. And it says, now the Philistines attack God's chosen people and the men of God's chosen people fled before them. Many were slaughtered on the slopes of Mount Gilboa. Many were slaughtered. What the Lord said came true. Because Saul's army consists of them sons that he talked about in chapter 8. Many were slaughtered. Them sons that God said that were going to build his chariots, run in front, in front of his chariots, his charioteers, build his weapons, work his fields. That's his army. They got slaughtered over the king you chose that caused you to reject God. The Philistines, verse 2, the Philistines closed in on Saul and his sons. This is the king you chose. We chose. God's chosen people chose. That caused them to reject God. And they unalived three of his sons. Jonathan, Abinadab, and Makashua. The fighting grew very fierce around Saul. And the Philistines' archers caught up with him 
and wounded him severely. Those sons got killed on Mount, ooh. Those sons got unalived on Mount Gilboa. Now Saul's kids are unalived on Mount Gilboa. Even Jonathan, David's best friend, twin, died on Mount Gilboa because of his father's disobedience. Three of Saul's son unalived because of his daddy's disobedience. And of course, if you've been following me, you know that Jonathan was a righteous man. Jonathan looked out for, for David. Jonathan chose... David over his own corrupt dad, King Saul. Why did Jonathan die, though? Why did twin die? The Bible doesn't specifically say why Jonathan died. But this is just what I received from diving into the text and just knowing how God thinks. And this is just my own, what I think about it. This is not Bible. I think because Jonathan, Abinadab, Malkishua were all close to King Saul when King Saul died. I think Jonathan's heart changed. It's just my own personal opinion. The Bible don't say it. I think his heart changed. Because you'll see throughout the scriptures, especially the Old Testament, men hearts started off good, but they will eventually change. King Saul started off good, but his heart started to change. Gideon started off good, but his heart started to change. Samson heart started off good, but it started to change. As they elevate, as time progress, their hearts change. And I got a question, and this is something I thought about. Jonathan, if you love the Lord that much, why are you still so close with an unbeliever like King Saul, like your daddy? After all these years, you still close with your daddy like that, and you know that he don't believe in the God that you serve? That's just my opinion. If you that close to your daddy in battle, maybe Jonathan's heart changed. Blood thicker than water, but the oil is thicker than blood. Blood thicker than water, but the oil thicker than water. Saul started off good, but this is another thing that I want to bring to our attention. I gave y'all a couple of examples of how men hearts changed. They started off good, but their hearts changed. Check this out with your boy. Go to, go to chapter 12. Help me, Holy Ghost. Go to chapter 12. Verse 6. Help me, Holy Ghost. First Samuel 12, chapter 6. This is Samuel, the prophet, the voice of the Lord, the high priest, the judge. This is him giving his farewell address. Say, hey, bro, I'm done. Y'all got King Saul. I'm, I'm, I'm resigning. And this is what Samuel is telling the people in chapter 12. God's chosen people. He said it was the Lord. Who appointed Moses and Aaron. He brought your ancestors out of the land of Egypt. Now stand here quietly before the Lord. As I remind you of all the great things the Lord has done for you and your ancestors. When God's chosen people were in Egypt and cried out to the Lord. He sent Moses and Aaron to rescue them from Egypt and to bring them into this land. But the people soon forgot 
about the Lord their God. God sent Moses and Aaron to get these people out of Egypt. Parted the Red Sea for them. A huge miracle. Part of the whole sea. On the live Pharaoh and his army. And the people get on the other side. And they forgot about the Lord. So he handed them over to Sisera. The commanders of Hazar's army. And also to the Philistines. And to the king of Moab. Who fought against them. Then they cried to the Lord. Again and confessed. We have sinned by turning away from the Lord. And worshiping the images of Baal and Asherah. But we will worship you and you alone if you will rescue us from our enemies. Then the Lord sent Gideon, Bedanian, Jephthah, Samuel to save you, and you lived in safety. So they rejected God and God raised up individual judges to go in there and get them out of bondage. It's a consistent cycle in the Old Testament of them rejecting God over and over and over and over. And God has to raise an individual up and get them out of bondage. Verse 12 says, but when you were afraid of Nahash, the king of Ammon, you came to me and said that you wanted a king to reign over you, even though the Lord your God was already your king. All right, here is the king you have chosen. You ask for him and the Lord has granted your request. Now, if you fear and worship the Lord and listen to his voice, if you fear and worship the Lord and listen to his voice and you do not rebel against the Lord's commands, then both your king and yourself will show that you recognize the Lord as your God. But if you rebel against the Lord's commands and refuse to listen to him, then his hand will be as heavy upon you as it was upon your ancestors. Now stand here and see the great thing the Lord is about to do. You know that it does not rain at this time of the year during the wheat harvest. And I will ask the Lord to send thunder and rain today. Samuel was a beast. Samuel said, I'm going to ask the Lord for it to rain. I will ask the Lord to send thunder and rain today. Then you will realize how wicked you have been asking the Lord for a king. So Samuel called to the Lord and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. Boy, Samuel was a straight beast on my step daddy. Boy, you go outside. Samuel had so much power. He'd be like, hey, whoo, hey, my boy. Hey, OG, make it rain. Boom, it started raining. Woo. And all the people were terrified of the Lord and of Samuel. <laughs> Them folks scared. Let's do it. Pray to the Lord your God for us or we will die. For now we have added to our sins by asking for a king. Don't be afraid, Samuel reassured them. You have certainly done wrong. Then we said, hey, you right. You've done wrong. Ain't no reason to get afraid. You already got married. Ain't no reason to be afraid. You already rejected God. But make sure now that you worship the Lord with all your heart and don't turn your back on him. Don't go back worshiping worthless idols and that cannot rescue or help you. They are totally useless. The Lord would not abandon his people because that would dishonor his great name for it has pleased the Lord to make you his very own people. As for me, I was certainly not sin against the Lord by ending my prayers for you. I'm still going to pray for you. I mean, I know you're in a toxic relationship. I know you chose to date somebody and when the Lord told you not to be dating. I'm still going to pray for you, but that's it. Them counseling sessions over with. Yeah. I ain't finna keep saying the same stuff over and over. I pray your faith don't fail. That's it. That's all I got for you. So if I don't respond, I'm praying. That's it. Because you ain't listening. I ain't talking to you. I'm talking to God chosen people. Yeah. Sam just said, as for me, I was certainly not sinning against the Lord by ending my prayers for you. And I will continue to teach you what is good and right. Oh, I'm still going to go live, but I'm just going to pray for you. You don't get no one-on-one -on -one no more because you ain't listen to the first thing I told you to do. I ain't talking to you. I'm talking to God chosen people. But be sure to fear the Lord and faithfully serve him. Think of all the wonderful things he has done for you. But if you continue to sin, but if you continue to sin, 
if you continue to sin, you and your king will be swept away. That's in chapter 12. Let's go back to verse 31. Y'all think it's a game. We think it's a game out here, just living reckless, living our best life, smoking hooping, hookah, hopping planes, sleeping with, dating them all. I just, just got to find the right person. I just, just got to date them all. Okay. Think it's a game. We see right here in chapter 12 where the people heart changed. Saul's heart changed. Maybe Jonathan's heart changed. I don't know. That's just my personal opinion with Jonathan. Why Jonathan had to die. John John. Twin. Verse 4. Chapter 31. Saul is wounded. Saul groaned to his armor bearer. Take your sword and unalive me before these pagan Philistines come to run me through and taunt and torture me. But his armor bearer was afraid and would not do it. So Saul took his own sword and fell on it. Saul has unalived himself. He unalived himself. And this is the thing that we have seen, that we see in today's society, man. People unaliving themselves is, is, is at an all-time high. And we just think that it's coincidence, and we just think that this stuff just be happening for no reason. No, bro, these, number, these numbers are increasing because we have consistently rejected God. Unrepentant heart. Saul never repented. Out of all the disobedience that we have read about him doing, he never repented. He consistently rejected God over and over and over and over. And this is not one act. This was a lifestyle. This was a lifestyle. Just like us, we have made disobedience and rejecting God a, a lifestyle. Look what Saul said in verse 4. This how far off this joker is. Look. Saul said, take your sword and unalive me before these pagan Philistines come to run me through and taunt and torture me. You mean to tell me, bro, you know you about to die and you talking about the enemy? You talking about yourself? Boy, I would have been like, Lord Jesus, save me. I know that I've been disobedient. Lord, help me. Lord, spare me, Holy Ghost. Lord, let your mercy rain upon me, God. I will. Lord, if you save me out of this, I promise you I ain't going to do it no more. But if you don't save me, Lord, I give my heart to you. I confess that Jesus is Lord. You died for my sins and you resurrected on the third day. Lord, I believe in my heart that you are Lord. I invite you. That's what I would have been saying. Bro, ain't nobody got time to be talking about what you're talking about, bro. This joker talking about, take your sword and unalive me. You on your deathbed talking crazy. That's how hard his heart has become. That's how calloused and how cold his heart has become. But it started off him being jealous of David because David defeated Goliath and the people were praising David. The women were singing about David. David unalive. Saul unalive the thousand. But David unalive ten thousand. It started with jealousy. Then it blossomed into hate. Then it became bitterness. And then we saw where he started unaliving priests. Saul started unaliving priests because of his bitterness. And now he, it has blossomed into him unaliving himself. You got to check that jealousy. You got to check that hate. Now, I ain't talking to God's chosen people. I'm talking to you. You got to check that hate. You got to check that bitterness. If you don't know what it looked like, I, you need to research what bitterness looked like. Can't nobody even ask you a simple question without you getting an attitude. 
Soon as you see your baby daddy phone number pop up on your phone, you talk to him like he crazy. That's bitterness. It could be towards your baby daddy. It could be towards your baby mama. It could be towards your daddy. It could be towards your mama. If you don't check it, I'm telling you, it's going to blossom into the wrong thing. Ask the Lord to help you work on that anger and resentment and bitterness. That's all it is. Saul fell on his own sword because he had unchecked resentment, jealousy, hate, bitterness. When his armor bearer, verse 5, when his armor bearer realized that Saul was dead, he fell on his own sword and died beside the king. When his armor bearer realized that Saul was dead, he fell on his own sword and died beside the king. Saul unalived himself because he already was wounded and he got a bad heart. But look at his armor bearer. And if you don't fall under the category of King Saul, you may fall into the category of his armor bearer. His armor bearer took himself out because of a broken heart. He wasn't wounded. He saw the man that he served die. And he said, you know what? I give up. I don't even have no reason to live anymore. Some of us have lost hope. Some of us have given up. Some of us are experiencing these emotions because we consistently reject God. We're never at his feet. So we have no hope. You don't have anything to look forward to. You don't have any vision. You don't have any word. You don't, you don't know. That's what happens. We live in a hopeless society. That's why unaliving of self is at an all-time high. Saul, armor bearer, took himself out because of a broken heart. Verse 6 says, so Saul and his three sons, his armor bearer, and his troops all died together that same day. All of them died. All of them. And I don't want to read that too fast. Verse 6 says, Saul and his three sons, his armor bearer, and his troops, and his troops. Who are those troops? Those sons that were mentioned in chapter 8. God told you what was going to happen. But you wanted a king anyway. What's your king? You don't have to go there. But chapter 26 verse 2 says, So Saul took 3,000 of God's chosen people, elite troops, and went to hunt David down in the wilderness. So approximately 3,000 people died. I ain't talking, no, 3,000 men died. Plus Saul and his three sons. Serving the king they chose. But this is the, this is a highlight of such a sad story. There's a beam of light in this. Let, let, but let, 3,000 sons, 3,000 husbands, 3,000 granddaddies, 3,000 nephews, 3,000 stepsons died. Serving the king you chose. But the beam of light is some of Saul's men were spared. Do y'all realize that? Some of Saul's men's men were spared. Which ones were spared, Reg? I don't remember seeing it in a text. I'm finna tell you. The ones who chose to leave Saul. And follow David. Yeah. The ones who left Saul and chose to follow David, those were the ones who were spared. 
Go to verse 22. I mean, chapter 22, verse 1 through 2. So David left Gath and escaped to, to the cave of Abdullam. Soon his brothers and all his other relatives joined him there. Then others began coming, men who were in trouble or in debt or who were just discontented until David was the captain of 400 men. Those were men who left Saul to follow David. They were spared because of who they followed. We got to be careful who we following out here. We don't think that it's a big deal that it matters who you follow. But let me share something with y'all. And I know some of y'all have heard this before, but this is a word that I received probably about seven years ago. A prophet told me this, my sister, Demetria, I love her to death. She gave me this word and it didn't make sense to me. This is a prophecy. This is something that God spoke over my life from a vessel that was talking about my future, the gift of prophecy. You know, AP, AP got that gift of prophecy. That joker can tell you what's going to happen and what the Lord is saying. Demetra has the same gift. But this is what she shared with me about seven years ago. Hold on. Come on, bro. Let me know in the comments if y'all can hear. Hold on. The Lord and you were sitting at a round table. Uh, I, heard, uh, I heard the spirit. Uh, I had a vision. The Lord and you were sitting at a round table. And when I saw the round table, I said that often when people are sitting at the round table, they get ready to conduct some business. The father pulled out a chair for you, and he had you to sit in the chair, and he sat across from you, and he was saying to you, Reginald, what do you think? And the Lord was saying that he's, this next thing that you're going to walk into is not going to be so much that God has said and you're being obedient, but it's going to be the fact that God gave you an opportunity to tell him what you think about it. And the Lord says there's going to be many conversations between you and him in regards to your thoughts or your opinions concerning a thing. And because the Lord loves you and you found great favor with him, there's going to be things that are spared because of you and his relationship. There are people who are going to be saved because God allows you to speak on their behalf. So the Lord says you have an anointing of a spokesperson. That was seven years ago that I received that word. Seven years ago that I received that word and it did not make sense to me. I was not doing no type of ministry. I was just a young dude going to the church with my pen and my paper, following the man of God, taking notes, seeking the Lord, listening to my sermons. And God spoke to me through a prophet. And what she said then did not make sense. What what I'm trying to say is it, it, it matters who you connected to. It matters who you're being led by. Sometimes God will spare you because of the person that you're connected to. These men are spared because they are connected to David. God is not saving them because they're holier than thou or they go to church or they fast. God is sparing them because they're connected to David. They chose to be led by David. I ain't trying to put myself on no pedestal. But what I'm telling you is some things and some people will be spared just because they connected to me. I, I didn't say it. God said it. You got to be careful who you follow. It could be the difference between life or death. So 
400 to 600 of Saul's men were spared because they left Saul and followed David. We got to be careful what leadership we are under. I know grandmama grew up in that church and I know that's where you first got saved and you got baptized, but you got to be careful who you are being led by because it's serious business. It's the difference between life and death. Verse seven, got to keep it moving. When God's chosen people on the other side of the Jezreel Valley and beyond the Jordan saw that the, saw that the God's chosen people army had fled, and that Saul and his sons were unalive, they abandoned their towns and fled. So the Philistines moved in and occupied their times, their towns. This, this chapter right here is probably one of the saddest chapters that I've had to teach on. But when I was reading this today, this verse seven pricked my heart. It hit me from left field when I was reading it. It says, when God's chosen people on the other side of the Jezreel Valley and beyond the Jordan saw that the Israelite army had fled and that Saul and his sons were unalived, they abandoned their towns and fled. So the Philistines moved in and occupied their towns. What are you saying, Reggie? What I'm saying is these men that were part of Saul's army died. The sons died. The husbands died. The uncles died. The granddaddies died. The brothers died. And guess what? Who were the people who had to abandon the town? It says they abandoned their towns and fled. Who were those people who fled? The women. Widows and single mothers. Widows and single mothers. They ain't got no man. The king they chose led their men to death. So now we got a people full of widows and single mothers and fatherless children. What in the United States is going on? Sons dead, husband dead, fatherless. And we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't have a problem with it. We've normalized it. We've normalized. I, I don't. I, we don't care. We don't have no conviction. We don't understand that we are under God's judgment. We just living our best life. We don't care. These women don't have no protection because all of their men died in battle, fighting for a king that they chose. But this is what we asked for, right? We wanted a king over God. Not realizing we are losing. We're, we're losing. The Philistines moved in and occupied their towns. Enemy that came in and took over. Took over our households. Took over our churches took over our ministries, took over our kids, took over our marriages, and we don't, we don't kill. Moved in and occupied their towns. Verse 8 through 10. The next day when the Philistines went out to strip the dead, they found the bodies of Saul and his three sons on Mount Gilboa. So they cut off Saul's head and stripped off his armor. Then they proclaimed the good news of Saul's death in their pagan temple and to the people throughout the land of Philistia. They placed his armor in the temple of the Asherites and they fastened his body to the wall of the city of Bethshan. 
Do y'all see how brutal this enemy is? Do, do you see it? I'm going to read it again. They cut his head off. Stripped off his armor. Fastened his body to the wall of the city of Bethshin. So you got a, 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 a decapitated body hanging from a wall. Do you see how brutal the enemy is? And you talking about I'm too harsh because your feelings hurt because I offended you? You've offended because I'm too direct and this enemy out here decapitating people and you talking about Reggie, you're too harsh. You hurt my feelings. You may not have a sense of urgency, but I do. I know how warfare is brutal. It's bloody. It's decapitating. Not just for me. But he trying to take out my whole family. You talking about Reggie, my feelings hurt. Ain't nobody got time for that. You're in a war and don't realize it and you in your feelings this is life or death. You may not have a sense of urgency, but I do. I know what demonic attacks feel like. I know how to feel in my bed, and I and I feel the enemy going straight for my neck. He ain't punching me. It's, it's this. It's that. It's this. You up here crying? Uh, he's too harsh. Man, this life or death, we in a war. And you worry about some feelings? You worried about being offended and the enemy trying to take your head off. You out here playing around. Red light, green light, hopscotch, PlayStation, patty cake. And the enemy got a red dot on your head just like this while you out here playing, hopping planes, dating them all, not going to church, not praying, not fasting, falling asleep when you're reading your word. Social media scrolling too much. You got a dot on your head and you just chilling. You just playing around. Not only you, but your kids. Yeah. Dot on your head. Just like this right there. Yeah. Just like that. And you playing. Your feelings hurt. You offended. You falling asleep. You have no sense of urgency. Do you see how brutal the enemy is? <sighs> Red dot on your head, my boy. This ain't no play play. We don't take this stuff serious. The enemy took, took their head off. Verse 11 through 13, I'm going to be up out of here. But when the people of Jabesh Gilead heard of what the Philistines had done to Saul, all their mighty warriors traveled through the night to Bethshan and took the bodies of Saul and his sons down from the wall. They brought them to Jabesh where they burned the bodies. Then they took their bones and buried them beneath the tamarisk tree at Jabesh and they fasted for seven days. These are the people that Saul helped in chapter 11 of 1 Samuel. When they found out what had happened to Saul, they were sick, didn't have no appetite. They fasted for seven days. And what we have seen tonight is the enemy has taken over. Unalived all the men. And now you're left with a group of people with widows, single mothers, fatherless kids. Why? Why did the enemy come in, Reggie? Not because they're stronger, not because they're bigger, because we chose, we chose, we chose a king over God. 
We chose something over God. And even when he warned us, showed us the red flags, sent us dreams, sent us prophecies, sent us vessels to say, hey, you may need to chill out. Hey, you may need to slow down. Hey, you may need to be quiet. Hey, you may need to get out that toxic relationship. Hey, you may need to get at the feet of the Lord. Hey, you may need to unplug from social media a little bit. We don't care. We just want to live our best life and choose the wrong king and not God. What's your king? What are you choosing over God? Not only what are you choosing over God, what are you choosing that's causing you to reject God? And God said, okay, since you wanted that bad, you wanted that bad, I'll give it to you. Go take out your kids. You're going to mess up your finances. Your rest in your time. And your relationship with God. We see it in the text. So we don't get surprised. We shouldn't be surprised. But this is this got the United States written all over it. This got some of us written all over it, but thank God that he saved me out of that lifestyle because I was headed, I was headed to Mount Gilboa. Where's Mount Gilboa? Where all these men died, Saul and his three sons. Your boy Reggie Taylor was headed to Mount Gilboa. And some of y'all are headed to Mount Gilboa and I'm trying to stop you. The Lord trying to stop you, but you don't want to listen. Everything is about you, but you're not realizing that there's an enemy trying to take you and your kids out and your family out and your mama out and your daddy out and your siblings out. We don't have time to be doing a lot of this stuff that we're doing. We're doing nothing but wasting time and feeling good with a red dot on our head. Rejecting God. Chase, my boy, what up? What's up, Mr. Ray? What's going on doing tonight? I'm um, heavy. I, I am too. Like, you, you started off tonight very heavy. Like, it was already convicting, especially when it comes to talking too much. And when I tell you it's been a rough couple of days, I and I had put up a question that I guess it kind of got lost in the comments, but probably. Um, when it comes to unbelievers and a lot of with my journey, especially with me being back in school, how it's not necessarily I can't word it like saying how do we discern a true unbeliever because nowadays even the enemy knows the word, and I know we briefly discussed that as well, and in the last couple of days. I had, and especially when it comes to like telling your testimony, when it comes to me being around a lot of collegiate students, I felt like I had, I had told my testimony to somebody and then I like later, not, not even an hour later, got convicted by the Lord. Ooh. And I kid you not, like it hit hard. And what had happened was I lost my, I lost my Bible. Kid you not, I had gave somebody a ride, don't know where my Bible went, it just disappeared thin there. And I had to come to the Lord and pray because I was that was my study Bible. Like that was what I was hitting every day. Like you asking how our devotion life is, that's what I was hitting every day to get in my word. Right. And what's crazy is the person that I had uh gave a ride, they were asking about my they also asked about it and we we were talking a little bit about the word and a little bit about church and I had gave my testimony which is similar to what I have told you about and in that way I was like should I have stayed quiet because I had kind of like that red flag feeling yeah but in a way it's like like you saying when it comes even to our prayer life we can't be too selfish and I felt like at that time that it was another person even that was in a way like had the same not similar story, but was coming out of like the similar thing 
that I was going through, and I felt like it was the time for me to speak that testimony. But at the same time, it's like you said, like the enemy is like a lion, and they be waiting to prowl. And yeah, you know, we've been talking, and with me not trying to figure out if I'm looking for a new church home and stuff, I guess he caught. I ain't gonna say I guess, but he caught me off guard, and <laughs> yeah, it, it, that that testimony is a tricky. It's tricky. I, I think I've done with with where you are relative to where I was when I was at the level that you were at, sharing my testimony did more damage than help. Because at that point in time, me sharing my testimony was me sharing it from a place of of of, of brokenness um and I wanted people to sympathize for me. It was kind of from a selfish place. It really didn't have nothing to do with Jesus for real. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us story is some of our testimonies is 95% us and 5% Jesus because we're just starting. So we don't have enough revelation to fully bring people to Jesus. We're telling people our story and it's only 5% Jesus. So when they walk away, they've seen a glimpse of Jesus and not the full goodness and the, the, the fullness of who he is. So right now with where you are, that's what we was talking about. Like when you are, when you rush into ministry, you don't, a lot of us don't have enough word to get people where they need to be. So we tell the people about us. So the people end up leaving knowing more about us than they do know about Jesus. But because we have a a zeal or desire to help people, we moving too fast. That's why we got to slow down. And so sometimes these leadership positions that we take without consulting with the Lord leads us into where people start worshiping us because God didn't really call us to that leadership position anyway. That leadership position could very well be a distraction for you, even though it's good, but it's not God. First, you got to get God and then you can help people just because it's a need and just because you're ambitious. Don't need don't mean that you're supposed to do it. So I think you place yourself in a situation where. Your leader, your position is causing you to share your testimony and God was like, no. They know more about Chase than they know about me. I need for you to tell people about me. So you told your testimony and they like, yeah, probably ain't time for that. But this is the thing. When we first start encountering God, we want to tell everybody about our testimony. And people, and I've been doing this for two years, bro. And people don't even know my testimony because God won't allow me to tell them. You teach the people about me. You tell the people about me. But until I had consumed enough word to tell people about Jesus, I was telling them about me. Those aren't the same. He told us to go out and spread the good news. Good news don't mean your testimony. And if it is a testimony, tell them about your testimony with Jesus, not your childhood trauma and divorce and abortion and all that stuff. No, tell them about Jesus. So I think your position putting you in a compromising situation where you feel compelled to tell people your testimony. But that's something that you got to lay on the altar. It may be, you you know what we're talking about. Yeah. Which is kind of confirmation like, with what you're feeling. It is. Because it's like a lot with this. It's, it's not like I'm seeking for it. It's like, and that's why I say he did catch me off guard. Because it's like, when it comes to me, then I'm like, okay. And I do need to start confirming more with God whether are not like what it is he's trying to tell me in those situations because it's like when the topic gets brought up i'm like okay maybe this is the reason why but it's not always the case and a lot with me i choose to stay silent i choose to stay all to myself but it's like when i have something brought to me it's like i feel obligated like you said to mm -hmm. and i gotta start feeling like that and i think and I told you about the people pleasing part of me that I'm trying to battle. Absolutely. Right now. And in this se in this season where you at, be quiet. For sure. 
You know what I'm saying? Like, be okay with, be okay with being a, but you can't do it in your own strength. It's not by might, not by power, but by his spirit. Invite the Holy Spirit in and tell you, hey, God, if there's, if there's a moment where I don't need to be talking, take my breath away. Because that what was happening to me, bro. Like, I would get, get into conversations and confrontations and want to correct somebody or I'm disagreeing with somebody. And I'll be like, <laughs> like you jump in some cold water, breath taken away. Taken away. Invite him in. He's just waiting on the invitation. He'll he'll make you be quiet. <laughs> <I hate it>. <laughs> <laughs> you rather him do that than for you to share and cast your pearls among swine. And as the word says, the swine come back and trample over what you just shared with them. What does that mean? You shared your testimony with the wrong person, and now it's all over campus. It's all on social media. And though that's the swine coming in back and trample it over you because the guy told you don't share your pearls, don't cast your pearls among swine. You rather for him to take your breath than for the swine to come back and trample over your, your pearls. And this is, invite him in, bro. We got to be quiet, bro. <laughs> Because it's not going to help you. And if you do share your testimony, share it in a safe environment. Somebody like myself, someone who can actually give you a solution. Sometimes we're pouring down and we're sharing our testimony with people who don't have the capacity to even help us. So why are you sharing? And this season is about healing and deliverance. So share it with someone who has the capacity to get some healing, that you can attain some wisdom or some healing from it. If you can't do that, don't say nothing. I hear you. And I, yeah, I feel like I've been denying it this whole time because um, I've been, I just got done studying the book of Esther and it was already convicting to me about trying to understand whether or not, especially being a Christian, and it's it's cool that um, Mr. Anson here, and he was talking about earlier today, unapologetically being a Christian. And yeah. a lot of times when it comes to that, I feel like whenever I'm in a room that I don't speak up or not speak uh -huh. up enough when it comes to God and like, and not even necessarily speaking up, but how Esther and her story, she had to, in a way, stay quiet for her identity because of what was going on. Mm -hmm. I didn't, it was kind of like conflicting with me because it's like, as a Christian, I don't want to feel as though I'm not being proud of God or being proud to represent God, and especially in a room or in a place where it's like, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. I be like, it'd be times where, like even at my job, they were talking about something. They were like, oh yeah, Chase is a, a real uh, dedicated son of God. And I was like, yeah, that's true. Like, even though I can tell they was trying to joke about it, I'm like, yeah, I am. Like, that ain't no, that ain't so nothing to so joke So out. Be it. Just be it. Yeah. Paul said we should be written epistles to be read by men. You can, I can walk into a place. I don't have to quote no scriptures. I don't have to say nothing. Just be the word. But it takes spending time with God to where you can be the word and people can look at your life and not even read the Bible, but they still see Jesus and you hadn't opened your mouth. But we hadn't spent time with them, so we feel compelled to open our mouth. No. I walk in the room. They see Jesus. Lord, I pray that they see you instead of seeing me. I ain't quote no scriptures. I ain't saying nothing about Jesus. I'm just being. Because then if you start opening your mouth and they start asking you questions, some of us don't know Jesus for real. We don't have no words. So we sound like Elma Fudd. And then they challenge and ask our, us questions. We be like, I oh, don't know. I'll get back to you. No, just. It's okay to be quiet. I'm just telling you, I don't care what situation you're placed in unless you have an absolutely strong desire to say something. Be quiet. Be quiet. That's, okay. just be That's just going to be the safest route. I hear you. I uh, appreciate that. So, I, 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 I appreciate you. all right, my boy. I appreciate you coming on, Chase. I appreciate your vulnerability. Yes, sir. I appreciate you having me. Yes, sir. What's up, James? What up, Ant? Yo, what's up, man? I want to talk to Chase for a second. No, brother. Okay. I'll Hold on. You. Let me let me let me get James on. All right, go ahead. All right, bro. 
What's up, James? Bro, I was going to speak to Chase too um, for a second, bro. Like, um, you know, definitely not much, bro. How you, how you feeling, brother? How you feeling? I'm heavy, bro. This word tonight. But, um, but yeah, bro, I was just calling to speak to Chase too. Yeah, it's super heavy, bro. It's super heavy. Um, to the point to chase that chase made, man, I've actually experienced that myself too. And like, after dive, you know, really diving and immersing myself in the word, we have to remind ourselves that people in today's time operate how like the Pharisees is operating, you know, they'll, they'll test you or say things specifically because they know, and it's almost oftentimes to trick you out your position. So mm. 95 to hundred percent of the time, bro. And he hit on the head already. It's best to stay quiet and people will will show you who they are without you having to say anything. I think Valerie put it in there like, you'll know based off the fruits of the people, whether or not that there's somebody that you should share their testimony with or not. But a lot of times, and, and I'm seeing it through social media and in the world right now, a lot of people are giving their testimonies out of feelings and emotions, and they're not actually being told by a God to really share that. You know what I'm saying? So it, it invites the enemy into your life. And it's very quick that he'll deter you and sabotage your testimony. You know what I'm saying? And, it, and it'll discourage you and take you off your walk out of purpose. Yo. So it's best bro to like really stay quiet and just be like, just be, just immerse yourself in the words, stay at the feet, bro. And he'll show you through just staying quiet and keeping your eyes open, your spiritual eyes open, who's for you and who's not for you when it comes to sharing testimony. I think we should lead with Jesus first and be and share our testimonies last. Like our testimonies really don't got nothing to really do with Jesus, a lot of the times, like he said, it's us. Yeah. And I don't think we should really be sharing it to people until we get to a point where they see so much of Jesus and God in us that then you can open them, invite you, invite them into your testimony in your life. Absolutely. So like with, to pick to pick it back off what you said. Pick it back off what you said. Um, yeah, we have to know them by the fruit. But this is the thing. Some of us hadn't even spent enough time with the Lord to even know what their fruit is. You get what I'm saying? The fruit is love, joy, peace, fact. patience, That's kindness, goodness, faithfulness, you know, gentleness. Um, you said it, we're jumping the gun. You know, we, <laughs> we don't to... even know what the fruit look like. If you don't know what an apple look yeah. like, and then yeah. I present an apple to you, you be like, what that? So some of us are so new in our faith, we don't even know what love look like. We don't know what joy look like. We don't know what peace is. We call it isolation peace. We don't even That's really know. That's a fact. And this is another thing to pick it back off what you're saying. You're making some very good points. Mark, you ain't got to go there. This is why we should be quiet. Starting off. Later, the leader sent some Pharisees and supporters of Herod to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested. Some of us are getting bamboozled because we, we're not ready. And these folks tricking us and they ain't just pharisees these are people who believe in the universe these are hebrew israelites yeah. these are yeah. we don't we don't know jesus so yeah. we don't have no comeback nope and they be so confident no like weapon. they they know their ideology way better than we do yep i just be yep. quiet that's a fact that, that's a fact they there they we don't have the word which is our weapon you know, and this of this process that God got us sitting in right now is so severe, and I and I say severe, especially for the men, it's so severe right now that a lot of the times when you ask the Holy Spirit, if you was to ask the Holy Spirit in real time, a lot of the time you should speak up, it's gonna tell you no. Like it's told me no a, a lot of times where I felt like I should say something, not no, it's gonna tell you no. We don't you're even not we don't even ask. Like you're still going through a process. <laughs> yeah, we we won't even ask. You know what I'm saying? People won't even ask, but you have to ask. And the Holy Spirit gonna tell you no. I guarantee it, because the process is so severe. Like before you go out there, before them disciples went out there and started speaking to the people, they spent years. They spent a lot of time with observing and watching Jesus move. So watch. I don't know what make us think that after like a couple days or maybe like you reading your word for an hour or two that you should go out here and start trying to tell people about you know, God and start ministering to people like, no, nah, the process is so severe. Like you probably just need to bank on being quiet for like a year to two years. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I went four. You just be, just, at, just be at, yeah, be at facts. Just be at the feet, be in a constant state of certitude. And he'll start to reveal to you when you really, truly should start speaking. Check this out, James. You know, but 
Congratulations to the point. Check this out, bro. Up, bro. This, this is where I got messed up. When you start moving ahead of God when it comes to ministry and being witnesses, because even the even the disciples needed the Holy Spirit before they went out and were sent out to be witnesses. We'll end up Googling not to find Jesus, but to win arguments. So you'll Google about the Bible, not yep. to learn about Jesus, but to, to win this argument that you got into in the break room today or to uh, see if Christmas is a pagan yep. holiday. So let me go find this scripture. And then that's how you yep. read the Bible to from a place of pride and self-righteousness, not to find Jesus. And that's how I started off. And what I try to do exactly. is to prevent people from doing that. Because now if you have conditioned your way to operate like that, we got people who've been in the kingdom for 20 years and they don't know Jesus, but they are just out here arguing all the time, bro. Win souls, not arguments. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I've been guilty of it as well myself too, but you yeah. know, God had to really show me like, bro, you can't, if you don't know the word and really immerse yourself in the word, if you can't carry, if you can't carry the word around you, you know what I'm saying? Like I use this, I use this for example. I used to carry a pistol on me all the time. Like I had a, I got a license to carry, concealed carry and everything. And God showed me in a dream. Um, I, I had a Bible in the dream. Like I had left a gun somewhere. And uh, I went the whole day without having a, the gun on me in the dream. And God was telling me like, basically like, bro, you don't need the gun. Like you don't even have the word on you, the, which is the true weapon. Like why you need to carry the gun on you. And bro, right. after I had that dream, I stopped carrying, I stopped carrying my pistol on me, bro. Like, and I just immerse myself in the word every day because I'm like, what's the point of, of having this? I don't even got no word protection on me, but I got a pistol on me every day. Like, what's on. the point? Same you know here, I'm like, I'm moving, I'm moving backwards for real, for real. I'm moving backwards. Like it don't even make sense. Right. So, man, ever since I've just been immersing myself, bro, like in the word, I don't even have to carry the weapon. You know what I'm saying? That is that is the weapon. The That's what it's intended weapon. for you to give me. Bro, you know what I'm saying? Me, like, let me uh James, stay on, bro. I want you to stay on, man. You know me and you always have good dialogue. Minister Ant, what up, bro? What's up? Yo, bro. What's up, bro? Chilling, man. What I'm, you got? First of all, say, appreciate you for being an amazing teacher, man. You up here breaking down that word like that. Appreciate That's it, awesome. bro. Appreciate that, man. So, man, um, yeah, just piggybacking off what y'all saying. Also, Chase, man, you you got to, your walk got to be louder than your talk. I think a lot of times when it comes to spreading our testimony, we have to have discernment and wisdom in doing that because your testimony in the wrong hands become weaponized. Mm. You know? mm. So we got to be careful. Uh, that's like handing somebody a loaded gun and you surprised that they try to take you out with it. Right. Also right. understanding this, that your testimony, even if you was to articulate it to your best ability, your testimony not for everybody, but the gospel is. Mm. Testimony is for, it's for target audience. God will, God will literally tell you who to say your testimony to. And also with your testimony, understanding that it's, two, it's duality. It's both your wounds and your scars. So even if God give you the okay to give you a tes testimony, many times people give the scars. But they and they and they skip over their wounds. Why do you still need Jesus? You start. You got to start breaking those type of things down to the people too. Yeah. Now. Yep. Now, fat. Now, fast forward. I want to say this too, man, because I was, I was actually in this earlier. Our uh, First John chapter three, uh, verse eighteen. It says, "Dear dear children, let's not merely say we love each other. Let us show the. They say, let us show, the truth by our actions." So basically, what Jesus is saying here is, hey, you this ain't this ain't you ain't gotta talk this thing out. Uh, if anything, allow people to see the spiritual receipts by the love that y'all show one another by your actions. What do your actions say when your mouth don't move? That's why it's so difficult when God tells us to stand still. We think that God's saying, stop talking. No, he's saying stop talking, but he also saying keep moving. Jesus always found himself in a situation where you look through the scriptures, you see he never ran. The reason why he never ran is because he understood his purpose and every step was aligned. And and he modeled that he modeled that for us to walk the same way. When he's telling the disciples to move with urgency, he's not saying run to the next next destination. He's saying, I need you to constantly move to the next destination because you gotta understand why you were sent there in the first place. And if we if we find ourselves 
trying to take up position just because it's vacant and you wasn't called to it, that's this is that's just as detrimental as not answering the call at all. Mm. One thousand percent, bro. Yeah. Man, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. But we gotta be we gotta slow down, man. That was the topic of my last live. We we get we get you know when you first get that new revelation from God, like you be so anxious to tell people and we we have to slow down because what the enemy will do is get us so exhausted and so discouraged to where we won't ever spread to God. He'll shut you up real fast because you'll have such a bad experience. You know, I had a homeboy one time. He had never worked out. So he go into the gym trying to do the same weight that I'm doing. Man, that dude almost broke his neck. He was sore for like a week. He ain't been back. His first experience caused him to not even want to go back to the gym. And sometimes because we move ahead of the Holy Spirit, our first experience with trying to share the gospel, it the 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 rejection comes from not the coworker, but your mama, your daddy. So after that cut, you be like, you know what? I'm not even gonna say nothing. Baby, you just gotta slow down. You have to know the scriptures. Even the disciples walked three years with Jesus before he sent them out. We going off three three days, three hours sometimes. We gotta slow down. But to piggyback on what, what uh, my boy James said, in John 18, this is the type of authority that we have access to. The same spirit that rose Christ from the dead is the same spirit that's within us. So when the people, the Roman soldiers and the Pharisees came to get Jesus, about to take him um, to prison and to crucify him, when Judas betrayed him, it says Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him. So he stepped forward to meet them. Who are you looking for? He's talking to the leading priest and the Pharisees and the Roman soldiers. They said, we are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene. They replied, Jesus said, I am he. As Jesus said, I am he. They all drew back and fell to the ground. Three words. And the soldiers fail. He said, I am he. If we have the same authority, if we have access to the same spirit, I ain't saying the soldiers go fall, but I'm just saying when you walk into environments, people should be able to feel the anointing and the authority without you even having to open your mouth. Like minister Ant, let your walk be louder than your talk. But because we don't really have a walk, we are forced to talk. Let's work on being quiet. What up, James? Did you have anything else? No, that was really good, brother. I just um, let know, brother. You know, keep going, bro. Just just stay at the feet. You know what I'm saying? And you'll eventually start to develop a lot more discernment of when you should say things and when you shouldn't. You know, especially when it comes to sharing testimony, bro. But um, and, I think and I, the more and more you stay closer to God, show you that thing, bro. He'll show you that. If it's with me, if it's in question, I don't even say nothing. I'd rather be safe than sorry. So yeah, facts. I don't say nothing. I don't say nothing. I would rather be. Yeah, I, yeah, facts. Because I was having this conversation the other day, nothing. and with with um, um with a young. Yeah. I was having this conversation with a young lady the other day, and she was saying that I think it was either a pastor or a say or a pastor or someone she's close to said something that she disagreed with and she verbalized that she disagreed with him. I was like, well, you didn't have to say nothing. You don't have to say nothing because you disagree with what somebody say. You don't have to say anything just because you disagree with what somebody right. posted. Sometimes I don't say nothing. I disagree with a lot of stuff. I don't say nothing. I don't care if we ride in the same car. I don't care if you worship crystals. Unless I'm led to say something, I don't say nothing. You can jump in my inbox and tell me your zodiac. I'm just going to keep talking like you ain't just said nothing. I don't, I'm not going to say anything unless the Holy Spirit tells me to say something. So you can be Sagittarius and we having a conversation. I'm be like, oh, for real? I ain't going to say nothing. Right. Because you, it's, it's going to become you know, it's exhausting. Not it's going to become exhausting if you have conditioned yourself to always disagree with somebody. 
But Jesus disagreed with a lot. He didn't always say anything. Nope. Nope. That's What's facts. You, and you don't. You don't. You do waste a lot of energy and time, you know, arguing with people and trying to prove points. Like you said earlier, people are set in their ways. It's people that are set on not understanding, or they're set on combating the word of God. That's where their mind is. They're not even, they don't care how what you tell them. They don't care how much proof you show them. Their mind is set to be the opposition. And you just got to understand that. You know what I'm saying? It just, it's, once you peep that, once you peep that, that's what people are on. And, and a lot of people will reveal that to you. It's best to say nothing and just keep it moving. They ain't going to see it no way, my boy. Exactly. They, 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 they can't. You know? it's, it says in 2 Corinthians 3.14, y'all messed up since I got a second electronic device. Your boy Googling these scriptures. I've been a busted head <laughs> wide open. No cap. 2 Corinthians 3.14 says, but the people minds were hardened and to this day, whenever the old covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds so they cannot understand the truth. And this veil can be removed only by believing in Christ. Some of us are up here arguing Fighting, spitting, screaming, sweating, and these folks can't see it. They got a veil over their eyes. Do you know right. how exhausting it is to try to get a blind person to see? They ain't gonna see it, my boy. Only right. Jesus can open up their eyes. But we have to be we have to be submitted to the Holy Spirit. And as James say, we skipping the feet part and trying to go minister. Right. Slow down. I don't care if it's a need. I don't care if it's an ambition. Just because it's a need and you're ambitious does not mean that it's God. That's facts. Minister Ant, did you have anything else? Ooh, man, I shouldn't have drunk that coffee and water. Lord. Yeah, my boy going through it. Nah. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to say, yeah, I agree. I think that God, like God did not create us to be great debaters. He called us to be disciples. And as a disciple, um, it's about being a lifelong learner. The moment that we stop learning is when we're in trouble. Hey. So we gotta continue, we gotta continue to sit at the feet of God, and He's the ultimate teacher of life. And a lot of times, um, when it comes to people trying to debate, you're not even trying to you're not trying to win no souls over. You just wanna Pride. you just wanna chat. Yeah, you just wanna chat. That's it. Hey, I think uh, we've twisted. I think we've twisted. I think we've twisted being defenders of the faith really think we got to um, fight, like be out here fighting and defending. <laughs> like Jesus don't need no help, man. Defend it by being the, being, like, being the gospel, like your walk. We think we got to argue and that's what defend means. That, that's not what it means in my opinion. Yeah, that's all, bro. But enjoy the rest of your night. Bro. Hey, man, it's the Ant, man. I appreciate you coming on, James. Valerie, what up, though? I'll make it quick because you look nah, like No, no, you, you about to, hey, you go ahead and take over while I go on break. <laughs> okay. Because I know you got some genius. Hey, y'all, right? I had to pee. That's right, it. You got it. Pee. Right. Okay. Hi, guys. Blessings to you. Um, I just wanted to share, since we're talking about um, keeping our mouth closed and whether to share our testimony, when to share it and when not to, I think that. Um, it's important for us to remember that we are to be like Christ, right? And even when you, hi guys, hi. Um, even when we think about Jesus, right? Whenever he healed somebody, he said, shh, don't say nothing, right? Go and sin no more. Um, and it's to the testament of Christ that we should, we should learn how to have discernment and when to open up our mouth and when not to even with good news think about it even if you're in a group and say you're around your cousins and some of them have not been able to find work hi um god bless you all god bless you and you god gave you a promotion and you at the family reunion and it is good news that you got the promotion right the bible says that promotion comes from god um so you got a promotion, but you at the family reunion, you know, you got some cousins that hasn't worked since his lemonade stand. And it's like, oh, but it's good news. And I want to confess it, even though it is good, even though God has done it, maybe it's not the right time. 
right? Like we need discernment on what to share and when to share it, how to share it. God bless you. Hi, blessings. And when to share it, like we have to be ever so careful. Um, so at work, they've been driving me crazy, right? And I was like, okay, so I got this notification and I was like, ooh, I'm about to go off in this email. And then I called my sister before I sent it or before I was like, should I send this? And I sent her the email of what I said. And she was like, you sounded kind of hostile. And I was like, all right, let me go back and change it. So I watered it down and put things like hopeful and prayerful of this, this and that. And I was like, you know what? I got it out. The Holy Spirit was like, don't send it. I was like, okay. Okay, I won't send it. And sometimes it's important to remember what is most important. You want to be right or you want to be righteous. Do you want to be right or do you want to be righteous? And I said, dang. (laughs) Let me delete this email I was about to send. Do you want to be right or do you want to be righteous? I said, okay, Holy Spirit, I won't send this email. Kindly cussing these folks out in Jesus name. Isaiah 53, 7, it says he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was oppressed and afflicted, and yet he did not open his mouth. He did not open his mouth. So like even, what happened? Am I getting the thumb? Oh, no, go ahead. Reggie, you good? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so he was uh, afflicted and oppressed and yet he did not open his mouth. So we need to, we need strong discernment on when to bridle our tongue. Like we really, really do. Even if it's good news, mm. even when it's good news to, to say, oh, having a baby and you're around a whole bunch of women who are barren (laughs) yes it's wonderful that god blessed you yes you toiled yes you waited yes let god be praised but we gotta watch what we're saying i call it situational awareness learn how to read a room give god glory right you and your husband do that do it personally between you and the lord Right. And then and then ask the Holy Spirit, when should I, maybe you're in a room where intercession has gone on and it's revival and you feel God stirring up the gift of the prophecy of the laying on of hands of whatever. And God wants to give women who are barren in the audience a blessing and their faith has been stirred up and they're in such a level of expectancy. And the Holy Spirit says, go share your testimony. They need hope. But it still takes the Holy Spirit in order to reveal to us what to say and when to say it and who to say it to. That's all I got. 1000%. And if we don't know, that means you need to be at the feet more. You don't know the boy. How can we be, <clears throat> how can we do ministry effectively as well as marriage and some of these other things that we are desiring to do and don't know the voice of the Lord? Get familiar with this voice before you start moving. But because we are so submitted to our emotions, we just do it because we feel the vibe. It's just the vibe. It's like it's just got the vibe. Slow down. And, and, and a lot of us get offended when we say stuff like this. But it's the truth, baby. Slow down. Like Truth I, went through, I, I went through a process. I just didn't get saved and all fell upon my head. The word that I gave y'all tonight was in 2017. I didn't start going public with ministry until 2020. And y'all still don't know my testimony. <laughs> God has not given me the green light. We have to be led by the Holy Spirit. That's it. Not a vibe, not our emotions, not a need, not ambition. You have to be led by the Holy Spirit. And if you don't know, you need to get at them feet. At the feet. 
I was at the feet for them three years. That word was released in 2017. Did I go start making content? Did I start? Nope. I went through process. David was, was anointed king in chapter 11, and it's chapter 31, and that joker still ain't became king yet. Where is he? In process. He's in process. His heart ain't ready. He don't know the voice of the Lord well enough. He don't know how to discern the spirits, the hearts of people. He don't know how to submit. He don't know how to lead. God has to take him through a process. We skip process and start trying to do too much stuff. Marriage is ministry. But you want a marriage. You got to know the voice of the Lord to know when to be quiet and when to talk. Do you have anything else, Bella? I know you do. I know it. I don't. Okay. Amen. Right. Word. I appreciate Word. you coming on. Though, I appreciate you coming on to hold the fort down while uh, that, co that cough and water is not a good combination for your body. It's all right. You had to let go and let God. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> But last time I drank coffee and water, I went on for over two hours. So that's throwing me for a loop because I'm used to, okay. you know what I'm saying? But I'm straight now. Yeah. I appreciate you holding well, it down we, for me. Absolutely. We appreciate your sacrifice. For sure. But man, um, I appreciate everybody coming on, especially the men. I told y'all the men are showing up and we did well tonight. We listened to Chase. We listened to James. We listened to Minister Ant. We listened to Valerie. You did well. This is a great way to end such a heavy life. This, 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 this First Samuel thirty-one is a very sad, heavy um, chapter. But it's us, man. I think God is saying, is showing us the consequences of our rejection of Him, and instead of us actually having to die on Mount. Gilboa, he's actually letting us see, like, you see what happened to Saul, right? You see what happened to my chosen people, right? And some of us are already living this, but it's not too late to repent. It's not too late for you to change. It's not too late for you to give God your yes. It's not too late because if we continue to go down the path that we're going, like King Saul, King Saul and his three sons died on Mount Gilboa because they didn't they didn't change directions. They didn't change their hearts. So I don't know. I don't I doubt if I repost this on my social on my YouTube because the live was um, jacked up tonight. And uh, I dropped. I was a little I was a little tough on y'all tonight, but it was tough on me. So. um I ain't apologizing tonight. <laughs> you just gonna have to be. Y'all just gonna have to be offended. Cause the enemy, enemy don't apologize. I, I'm not either. Cause I didn't say nothing outside what was in scripture. And a lot of the times I wasn't talking to y'all. I was talking to God chosen people. I ain't talking to y'all. I'm talking. <laughs> Man, let's hear this word and, and apply it and don't leave it on this live, man. I want this thing to keep you up tonight. And whatever is your king in your life that's causing you to reject God, invite God in and say, God, take it away. I know it's going to hurt, but take it away. I know it's going to be uncomfortable, but take it away. I know it's going to be inconvenient, but take it away. I know it's scary, but take it away. Because we ain't trying to die on Mount Gilboa. Not on my watch. So you can be offended and your feelings get hurt it's because I care about you and I love you. If I didn't love you, I'd just let you go down to Mount Gilboa. I said, go ahead. Oh, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful scene over there and everything. The trees are so green. The rocks, they got a little, a little stream going down Mount Gilboa. Yeah, it's beautiful. No. <laughs> anyway. Go to my YouTube, subscribe, Reggie Taylor 704 Follow me over my other social media platforms. Um, follow Miss Valerie down low. Give you whatever her stuff is. Follow her over TikTok as well as her. I think she got YouTube. Um, 
And if you have an unction to give, my my cash out, my PayPal is R E G G one four one four, R E G G one four one four. My Venmo is Reggie Dash Taylor Dash fourteen. Now I'm gonna say this before I get up out of here, because this is the instructions from the Holy Spirit. Um, I don't know if y'all ever watched The Chosen, but there were numerous times where Jesus would disappear. And other people will come ask his disciples, what Jesus at? We don't know. When he coming back? We don't know. So I'm entering into a, I don't know what Reg is. Because the pool of the pool, the pool of people gets exhausting. And I think that's why Jesus would disappear because it's, it's such a demand to where people touch, 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 ask, ask, ask. And I don't have a problem, but there will be moments where you dis you'll see me post, but I ain't responding to no messages. It, 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 it's become exhausting. So Jesus did it. He gave me the green light to do it. So sometimes I may respond. Sometimes I don't. It don't mean I don't love you. It don't mean I don't want to help you. But I can't let people run me into the ground. And that's what happened. Jesus went off to the mountain and prayed. Reggie going off into the mountain and I'm do angels go pray. There's a lot of other stuff I need to be doing. I'm just not going to be accessible to people like that. So um, don't mean I don't love you. It just means I'm going to have moments where I unplug, but I'm still plugged in. So you may see me post. Don't get offended because I didn't respond to your inbox. I don't think people understand the, the pull, the, the, the challenge, um, the, ex the exhaustion that comes with doing ministry. And um, I took two naps the other day and I don't take naps and it ain't no physical exhaustion. I know it's spiritual and it's emotional and I pay attention. So if I'm taking naps during the daytime, I need to do something different. So I'm doing something different. And I'm not just about to change behavior and not inform you. I'm informing you. So don't get in your feelings. Because remember, the enemy ain't playing out here. So this ain't the season for you to get in your feelings or be offended. Have a sense of urgency. So that means get out of your feelings. But I'm here. I'm still going live. I just not may be as accessible as I was in previous times. That makes sense. That makes perfect sense. I think there's a danger when the pool of the people is stronger than the pool of God and moving into the pool of the people more. And then people become the idol. That's dangerous. And then you're useless. We need you to fulfill purpose. We need yeah. your cup to overflow and that you give out of your overflow instead of your reserves. So be a Kit Kat, okay? Get a man a break. <laughs> It's all yeah, yeah, that's what uh King Saul lost his kingdom by looking at the faces of the people. The people go, they go, nah. That's why God pulled me out of the church because these pastors are being ran in the ground. So uh again, I'm gonna say this again. I love y'all. This ain't got nothing to do with you. This is the the, the the Holy Spirit instructions, Reggie, unplug, bro. You can't help everybody. But this is the thing. I got to trust the Holy Spirit that the word that went forth tonight, that you don't hit me up in my inbox and ask me, you go back to 1 Samuel 8 and 1 Samuel 31 and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Instead of becoming dependent on me, I want us to depend on the Holy Spirit anyway. So this is, um, instructions for Reggie, but it's instructions for you, because as long as you depend on me the way that some of us are doing, you're going to be a weak Christian, a one who out here trying to do marriage and ministry and parenting and don't know the Lord voice of the Lord. You just know the voice of Reggie. Not on my watch. We're going to learn the voice of the Lord. And so we have to go to him when we have questions. Will I be accessible sometimes? Yes. But all the time? No. I get in trouble. 
So God, we thank you tonight for this word, although it was very heavy. We pray that we don't leave this word on this live tonight. God, we want to invite you into our lives, households, our hearts to address the kings that we have chosen over you, the things that are causing us to reject you, oh God. And when we have moved in error, God, we want to repent tonight and turn away from those things. All it takes is a simple yes, a, a simple change of direction, and you will lead us the rest of the way. It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by your spirit that we're going to be able to walk away and be able to cast down some of these kings and imaginations as well as relationships that we've placed above you. Give us more discernment. Give us more of your spirit. Give us direction. And if you aren't there, we don't want to be there. We want to be and to inhabit your spirit everywhere that we go. God, we thank you that you are maturing us and that you are warning us without us having to experience the consequences of our rejection and our disobedience, we were able to read it in black and white in your word instead of reading it in our lives. And we're having to suffer the consequences. So God, block us from dying on Mount Gilboa. Block our kids and our sons and our daughters and our mothers and our parents and our fathers and our sisters and our brothers and our nephews from dying on Mount Gilboa. Let us get a spiritual toughness, God, that we're not so easily offended, that we aren't getting our feelings hurt because we saw tonight where the enemy don't care nothing about none of that. We got to have a sense of urgency. So, God, we thank you that this word tonight was well received, that it fell on good ground and it, will, and it will produce good fruit. We thank you that the men are coming and we are responding in a healthy way. God, we thank you for the increase that's going to take place numerically as well as spiritually. And we just pray that you continue to allow this momentum that we are experiencing to continue to increase individually as well as a community. God, we know that this is not only a community, but an army. So therefore we have to know spiritual warfare. And we know that you said in your word that you would skill our fingers for battle and our hands for war. We're in a war. So give us the equipment as well as the skill to be able to navigate it. Thank you in advance. Thank you for hearing us. You always hear us when we pray in Jesus name. Amen.